Okay, let's get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending this meeting. I uh, want to thank WCTV for recording it and uh, putting it on the channel and on YouTube. Um, I want to have the meeting in this format, not in a council meeting, because it can be much more informal uh, without a, a full meeting of the governing body. Uh, and so to that end, um, you know, there won't be any minutes from this meeting or anything like that. Uh, there's no need for minutes unless it's an official governing body meeting. Um, so just a few introductions. Um, I'm happy to say this evening we have with us President and CEO of Boswell Engineering, Kevin Boswell, Recreation Director and Senior Member of the Rec Advisory Board, Eamon Toomey, Administrator Mark DiCarlo, and Executive Assistant to the Administrator and I, Renata Duleski. Just want to take a couple minutes and give the uh, the recent history of the Swim Club Park property, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. When the Swim Club property was put up for sale, we expressed an interest in it, as did other parties. They originally accepted an offer from another party that was going to run a camp. That deal ultimately, ultimately did not close. At that point, the property was in danger of being sold to a developer or going to a tax sale. Neither the sellers nor the town wanted to see go to a developer, so we quickly negoti negotiated a purchase price of 750000 toward which we received an open space grant in the amount of 438000 so the town accomplished its primary objective of ma as maintaining the property as open space for a net cost of less than 350000 for over six acres of property, instead of it potentially becoming high-density housing. After seeing and hearing what is happening in our surrounding towns, I have little doubt that that was a good possibility. Instead, we are now here to determine the best uses for the property. I would now like to ask Kevin Boswell to give a presentation as to what areas of the property can support different activities, given its, both its topographical and environmental challenges. And uh, he'll dim the lights so everyone can see the uh, projector. I am uh, Kevin Boswell. I'm, uh I'm with Boswell Engineering. I'm a licensed engineer, licensed planner uh, in the state of New Jersey, as well as uh, numerous other uh, states as well, jurisdictions. Uh, uh, Mayor, I congratulate you and, and the residents on getting this property. Again, 6.1 acres. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a parallelogram in shape. On the westerly side, you have the Musquapsink Brook. Uh, and and the Garden State Parkway. To the north, you have Gardner Field. There's a, uh, a freshwater wetland area uh, between this property and the actual field and basketball courts over at Gardner's Field. Uh, the entrance comes in from the east, and the primary elements of the property are uh, there is an enclosed uh, former swim club that uh, uh, basically has a large uh, parking lot area, uh, a former clubhouse with a concession area, some lockers uh, inside, a, a waiting pool, kiddie pool, a five lane uh, competition uh, swim pool, and what we refer to as a dive tank on this. Uh, there's some open decks there is a, a pump house and lifeguard uh, shack here. Um, there are some, there's a basketball court uh, down immediately adjacent south of uh, the parking along what I'll call the lower uh, portion of the property. Uh, there's a, a, I think it's a volleyball area and there are some shuffleboard areas, uh, again, south of the volleyball area and a small storage shed. A lot of the property is wooded. It's wooded along its uh, easterly boundary, uh, southerly boundary. Uh, it abuts single family homes to the east and to the south. As I said, Garden State Parkway to the west, <coughs> Gardner Field and environmentally restricted areas uh, to the north. The Musquapsic Brook is uh, something that's referred to as a category one waterway. And because of that, there is a riparian buffer that is imposed that is distant 300 feet from the brook and it runs pretty much in this area 
parallel to the brook. So it basically uh, does impact uh, the, the development of undeveloped areas, uh, tree removal, uh, filling, uh, and what have you, in the uh, vicinity of this environmentally protected area. There's also, uh, uh, we have not yet done a, uh, it's called a letter of interpretation for freshwater wetlands, but uh, we've walked the property and it appears that there was a freshwater wetland area to the north in the Gardner Field site. So there is a buffer area that extends uh, 50 feet around that area. So this is referred to as a transition area uh, from an environmental uh, permitting perspective. The grades. Uh, the grades are a, a very significant characteristic of the property and we have another slide that, let's, let's try to go there, let's see if we can read it. Keep going, keep going. The, uh, you can't really see it. Uh, well, this is, this is the, as I said, this is the riparian buffer. This is the freshwater wetland offset to the wetlands that are on the Gardner Field site. Uh, but let's go, let's go back to the first slide, the picture right here. What happens is when you enter the property, you enter at, at an elevation of about 130. And the, you, you actually come up in this area to the pool deck area, which is about 138. So from the entrance to the property up to the community clubhouse, uh, first floor clubhouse is about 137. And then you step out on a pool deck that is about 137, 138. And this whole area uh, is basically about 137, and that begins to fall off rather steeply. And I, I bring that to your attention because these areas are used for parking, but they're very steep areas for parking. A typical parking lot uh, is somewhere in the four, uh, I'm sorry, three to five percent grade. These grades, uh, particularly in this area, are in the nine or more percent grade. So it's falling very steeply in this area. So as I said, this, this pool deck area runs about 137, 138. Down along the parkway, uh, it's about 113, 114. So uh, what happens is in this middle zone, and in this parking area, it slopes very steeply for a parking area in here. And then it slopes very steeply in this area. Uh, frankly, what I believe happened was when they excavated for the pool, they probably pushed all the dirt out and then formed a very steep uh, escarpment here. Not unlike you'd see in like a, a sand pit, a quarry operation. So it's, again, about 134 to 137 here, 134 in this area, and that drops down a good 18, 20 feet into this area. And then it, uh, the parking uh, runs from about 116 at this location down to about 114. As I said, these areas are lower for about 113. So basically a flat area, a flat area. You come in at 130, you go up to 137, 138, or you come down and you drop down to about 115 in this area. So this is 20 feet lower, 23 feet lower than this area. And everything else is sloping or it's a very steep uh, grade in between. So. Over the last several years, we've looked at a couple of different plans. Uh, one of the first plans we looked at was to put uh, softball fields on here, and I'll come back to that. That's one of the slides we have uh, at the end. Another thing that we looked at was to put a lacrosse field, and uh, it would generally follow this orientation in here, but what happens is 
again, when you get to this point, you start building retaining walls. And retaining walls translate to a lot of earthwork, uh, a lot of money for the, for the uh, retaining walls. And as I talked about earlier, the riparian zone limit is in this general area. So when you start clearing trees in here, you have to get environmental permits from DEP. And if you start building a 10, 12, 14 foot high wall and clearing trees to do it, it becomes a very difficult, uh, what I refer to as risk money uh, application. Uh, when you design something like that uh, to take down a lot of trees in an environmentally sensitive area, you, you have to fully design it. You have to fill out all of the uh, environmental reports that have to go in and then they get submitted and there's no guarantee of success. And, uh, and it is, it is a, uh, it's a difficult and lengthy permit to get. So what we did um, earlier this year was we redirected our efforts to say, what can we do uh, with the general grades that are here? And, and we went to the committee and to the mayor and council and, and asked them what, what type of venues uh, made sense on the property. And we fell out of a more active recreation uh, type of utilization of the property to a more passive utilization of the property. And there, I'd like to go to the next slide. So this next slide is really set up around the grades that I just was talking about and the environmental restrictions that are inherent to the property. What happens is, is you come in at, again at about elevation 130. Uh, this area, uh, you could put two or more barrier-free parking spaces in this area. And then this is shown as what we refer to as a great lawn. This, de this depiction is 51,000 square feet. One acre is 43,500 and 60 square feet. So this great lawn has a, uh, uh, is, is over an acre in size, and it is surrounded by a continuous 10-foot uh, wide asphalt walking path. The walking path and the great lawn all have grades of less than 5%. And the reason why that's significant is that makes this entire area fully ADA compliant. So that means that uh, it's not just compliant for people in wheelchairs, it's also compliant for people who just want to get out and walk. It's a very pleasant walk when you're on 5% or less. So we do a lot of parks. Uh, I, I, we, I'm sure we do between 10 and 20 parks a year. Uh, and what we try to do is we try to identify areas of parks or try to design parks in totality to be barrier free. So what happens here is this entire area is uh, barrier free. There's a small rest area that's located at this area. Again, it's, it's strictly a comfort station, a men's and ladies restroom, uh, some barrier free uh, parking in this area. And then what happens here is this driveway runs at about 7%. So it's running at 7%. So that earlier I said, you prefer to have parking in the three to 5% grade area. And that's why what we've done is we've located the majority of the parking in this area. And if you switch back for a second to the first slide, Wilson, as I said, all of this area is currently asphalt, as well as the basketball court um, and and this area is concrete deck, and of course there's a lawn area, but concrete, building, and then this is asphalt. So let's go back to the uh, slide. So what happens is, is when you pull out asphalt in these areas and you establish, you replace impervious areas where vehicles were driving all, the, all through here. As you recall, the, the uh, parking area came up to about this location. So what we're now doing is we're replacing impervious areas 
with with pervious areas. These areas obviously would be landscaped. Uh, and so this here uh, would be a, a new parking area. And uh, about two years ago, the state of New Jersey uh, changed uh, the stormwater regulations. And what, it, what they said was uh, the days of the subsurface detention areas, uh, detention basins, all now have to become something referred to as, as uh, bioretention basins. So basically, basins need to be built that will percolate uh, water back into the ground, and they have to be designed with strict controls. So what we did was we looked at the, the surface area of all of this impervious, and then we practically reduced it. And this is the only place where vehicles would be driving. And then the rest of the impervious area um, consists of four pickleball courts, a, uh, a dog park, in this area and again these and then this is a a playground area and these shapes really are placeholders uh, and again right right about here is the existing basketball court these could take on obviously a much more amorphous shape they can be free form uh, in size and in this area if we go back to the original slide you see structures here you see old macadam in this area you see a storage building here. There's actually uh, asphalt ruins in this area. So what happens, let's go back to the second one. What happens in this plan is, again, we're gonna get credit. We're going to receive credit uh, when we pull out these asphalt areas that are in there. And now they become opportunities for some version of a pathway. Uh, as I, I kept saying earlier that um, this whole path, this whole Great Lawn, is 5% or less. This area is 7%. So what happens is you want to try to add in some version of a, a walking path that may follow the, a route such as this, which gives you a little bit more uh, run to, to uh, make the slope more mild, and then it would allow you to link this entire area with this upper area. Again, this is all about 137 to 134, 133, down to uh, another area down here, which is about 115. So again, you're looking at two very distinct areas, and you're trying to pick a plan that by doing it in this manner, uh, you're, you're significantly decreasing the cost the development cost because uh, there are minimal or no retaining walls necessary uh, for this type of layout. If you were to square this off, uh, you could easily be looking at some version of a 15 to 20 foot high retaining wall. So what we're really doing is we're following the grades in this area uh, and basically this amorphous shape uh, really does serve a purpose. We do have a little turnout area that could either be uh, benches or a play area uh, in the uh, southeasterly corner of the of the walking path and what we see in a lot of these areas is um, many times is the walking path becomes the place where a lot of people go they park their cars they go for a walk uh, and they, they they spend a nice day having a picnic this also has the potential to be used much in the same way it was with the former swim club. Uh, this could be a picnic area. Again, this could be some version of um, some other active use. Uh, a basketball court could probably fit in this area. Uh, noise with the neighbors is obviously not a concern with these three venues uh, being right and that your neighbor is the uh, Garden State Parkway. This area, uh, again, is a very passive type of use. Uh, it's not something that you would equate with a, a ball field, a, a football field, a baseball field, softball field. Uh, it's really just a, a place that you would go and, again, it's a passive use. Uh, we do have some uh, photos that were provided of the other venues 
in town just to give you a, a snapshot of what the other venues are. So Wilson, um, we have Memorial Field, which uh, has, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to move in here. Uh, it's a multi-purpose field, a little league field, softball field, which is 60 foot bases, uh, a baseball field with 90 foot bases, a basketball court, playground, uh, a, uh, a pavilion, and uh, so it's, it's your primary uh, uh, park in town. You have Sherry Field, where you have three uh, Little League baseball, softball fields uh, facing each other, a small snack stand and, and, and Porta Johns. Um, over at Clark Field, you have a Little League baseball field with 60 to 7, 70 foot uh, bases, uh, a basketball court, uh, and uh, a small snack stand and restrooms. And, and Gardner Field, as I said earlier, you have, you have a, uh, a, a, a truncated uh, baseball field. This gets tight, tighter in this area. And a basketball court. Uh, and you have that same Mesquap St. Brook running along the Garden State Parkway. So this entire area from the Mesquap St. Brook over is within the 300 foot riparian buffer. So the ability to, to clear trees in this area is, is greatly restricted. And again, to get those types of approvals, it's what I refer to as risk money, risk capital. Uh, and it's, it's not an easy thing uh, to get. This is a, uh, an overall shot of the swim club property and the adjacent uh, Gardner uh, field. So it does show that there's, uh, we, we have looked at uh, something referred to as a primitive path system. They're very easily, very easy to get permits for. Uh, we have routinely gotten permits uh, in a lot of very heavily regulated areas. Uh, if you're familiar with the Franklin Lakes Nature Preserve, there's a, uh, a primitive path around the perimeter of the uh, uh, of, of the reservoir, then there's another set of uh, pathways across some islands with floating uh, bridges. There's uh, some some floating docks that go through some wetland areas. Uh, so they're getting approvals for a primitive path. Pretty straightforward thing. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, primitive paths. They're not and they're not costly. And you can generally uh, do this type of project as a separate standalone project. You can go apply to Bergen County Open Space, the Bergen County Open Space Trust Fund. They have a much more long name. It's the Bergen County Open Space Historic Preservation Floodplain Management Trust Fund. They have two pots of money. They have an acquisition pot of money and then they have a park development pot of money. The, the acquisition uh, pot of money is actually uh, funded with, with additional dollars and gets fewer applications. And that's how you were successfully able to uh, get $438,000. The park development funds are um, more competitive. Uh, they're matching monies and, uh, and they, they have certain restrictions on them, uh, such as uh, you can't build bathrooms with them and things like that, but they're matching. But there are a lot of uh, different things that qualify, uh, they qualify for, and this, this type of primitive path network is one of those types of things. So what we look at uh, when we look at a piece of property that you have is we go back and we, let's go back to the prior slide. What we do is we try to say, okay, this is the project, this is the master plan. And you may say, you know, someday we want a playground, someday we want a dog park. Uh, you may build a dog park and say, one day we may want some other element. And you could stage those things. So there's an argument to be made to doing it that way. Uh, I could tell you in Upper Saddle River, there's a, there's a park uh, at the intersection of uh, East Crescent Avenue and Lake Street. Uh, it's a nine acre park that it was just built. <clears throat> and we designed we used uh, parkland uh, acquisition funds to buy the, pr the property, and now we're using park development 
funds to buy bleachers and scoreboards on the north, and then we got we got them last year for for the bleachers, and now we're we we directed that to the northerly bleacher system. Now we're going for the southerly bleacher system. We're going to go for the scoreboards and another set. So basically what happens is you identify certain elements that you can defer, and then that way you can reduce the cost to the, to the citizens uh, as, you, as you build out the project. Uh, there's, what's not shown on here is lighting, uh, some version of lighting. Typically, uh, you would want to have some, some very uh, directed shielded lighting in the parking areas for safety. You may determine to light this area. Uh, the walking path is generally not uh, uh, something that needs to be lit. It could be pedestal bollard type lights. Uh, we've done projects where you put in uh, an electric service and then you, you put in foundations and conduit and then you come back and you put an application in to add the bollards that may be along a walking path in a, in a future grant application. So again, there's there are a lot of things that you can do uh, in this area. Um, the last slide we have, let's go to the, this one. Th this was an earlier version of what we were looking at. The first thing I'll show you is there are these two primitive paths in this area that showed a link between Gardner Field and, and this area. Um, this is a tough project to build because right here, these parking spaces get very steep. And really, if you had to maximize parking, which you have to do when you have active uses like this, you, you really need to generate uh, the parking demand that you have here. Versus a passive use, let's go back to slide number two, when you don't need as much parking. So this has less parking because there's less demand generated with these types of uses. So again, let's go back to the other one. The other one here, again, right here, you can see how the uh, contours play in. It gets very steep in this area. These contours, which are very close together, that's actually, uh, this is the limit of the pavement. You can just see it underneath these areas. So, uh, and the pavement goes all the way up to this area. This is all paved and then comes all the way down into this area. So there's a large paved area. It's steeper than I would recommend if you were to go ahead and do this. I wouldn't recommend doing it that way. Uh, if you've ever been to Don Bosco High School, they have a very steep walking path going to their stadium, Grand Tell Stadium. That's what this will be like. And you know, you're trying to design this for decades out you know, for, for future generations. And this, this, is, uh, this is what worked for a private little swim club, but as a public uh, facility, we wouldn't recommend that. So let's go back to the slide number two. Um, it's, it's got uh, the general parameters of, of again, a, a, a passive use in the, in the main area, the upper area and the active uses, uh, activities being jet, uh, oriented towards the west of the property. But uh, we know that there can be a lot of uh, 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 vegetation uh, planted in these areas. There could be augmentation of vegetation in these areas. One thing I did not mention was in this area, we're maintaining a 20-foot buffer uh, there was a neighbor who, right over here, uh, and um, the distance right now from this property line to the existing fence line is about 40 feet. So we're showing this to be within that area, in this one area, um, and that, that one area is one zone where it does extend further in, but with the, with the exception of that, this basically follows um, the existing development pattern that was previously there for the swim club. Uh, there is a fence that follows in this general area down here. So uh, that's a to be determined uh, element of the project. But of course, that's something that's a consideration that we would always have when we build a park. 
So that's that's really the end of my presentation. I'm happy to to answer any questions, comments, and and uh, try to respond to your concerns. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, can you just take a minute and uh, let the the residents know Boswell and the history and what you bring to the table, like how many parks and fields you've designed? We're in a hundredth year uh, of business. Uh, we uh, uh, we. I'm sure we, as I said, I, I've been, I'm 64 years old. Uh, I've been doing this for 43 years, 42 years. And, uh, and we do between 12 and 20 parks a year. As I just, I, I alluded to one Lake Street in Upper Saddle River that was delivered this year. We just delivered a, 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 a burn field in Roseland, about the same size project. That was about an $8 million project. Delivered that um, about a month ago, groundbreaking. Carfield High School, uh, $10 million project. That's being delivered at the end of, uh, at the in the middle of next month. Uh, we, we, uh, we're a full service company. We're working in Secaucus. We, we represent approximately 50 towns uh, throughout Bergen, uh, Passaic, Hudson, Morris counties. Uh, and we're regularly used as a, uh, park designer for many board of eds, uh, Bernardsville. We're doing their fields right now, Morris Township. Uh, so statewide, uh, we've done a lot of uh, different projects. We we have an expertise in environmental permitting, uh, site remediation. Uh, I didn't talk about the building earlier, but we have a environmental scientists that look at uh, the conditions of the existing building uh, for such things as lead asbestos. Uh, uh, underground storage tanks and things of that nature. So we are a full service company. We're, we're, we're about 300 people now. Uh, and uh, so we, this is something we do on a daily basis. We have a team dedicated to it. Okay. Thank you for that presentation, Kevin. Um, we'll, we'll do a Q&A session uh, coming up very shortly, uh, but I would now like to ask uh, Eamon Toomey to come up uh, and read to, to uh, those who are here um, the letter presented to the public and the council as to the recommendation of the plan for the property. So, thank you. Oh, yeah, please. Thank you. Hi, uh, Eamon Toomey. I'm the director for the Recreation Committee. Um, we, the members of the Recreation Advisory Board, representing a cross-section of our residents, unanimously recommended the accompanying layout of the former swim club property for the following reasons. To maximize passive recreational use, to, it allows flexibility for young children and senior citizen activities on the Great Lawn. It provides an alternative space for movies, concerts, and other events that, prefer, that preserves memorial fields. Uh, it provides a convenient dog park that is within the walking distance for many residents. It includes a secure walking and cycling path around the Great Lawn. It stays with the open space concept in keeping with the conditions of the grant we received to acquire the property. The simplicity of it maximizes cost and ongoing maintenance. We would look forward to working with the public and the council to bring this property online to serve all residents for decades to come. Respectfully from, and we do have a number of our uh, council members or our recreation committee members here, Tim Ritter, um, Jim Hansen, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get your name, and Sasha Lopez. So, take any questions? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Just one correction, Eamon. Uh, I think you said uh, the simplicity of it maximizes costs, it minimizes okay. costs. Oh, <laughs> uh, different word, but. <laughs> Okay. That's me every day. So. Yeah, okay. um, so, um, I'd now like to open the meeting to the public. Uh, I would ask that you begin by stating your name, and although not mandatory, your address for the record. The only topic being discussed this evening is the future plan for the swarm, former swim club property. All other topics should be brought up at a council meeting. Um, so, uh, for WCTV's sake, we'll ask, uh, you know, raise your hand, I'll choose someone. You can come up here, speak so they can see you, and uh, then you know, we'll have a dialogue based on your questions with uh, whoever the questions should go to. So, uh, anyone want to come up, ask any questions, comments? Hi, my name is Susan Broski, and um, my address is 452 Ridgewood 
Boulevard North, and that is right there, okay? Um, at the present time, we have a 40-foot buffer zone, and on this, on this um, schematic there, it's showing 20 feet. We also have, right now, we have a, um, a fence, and I wanted to know if, A, you would consider keeping the buffer zone as it is with the 40 feet, and if the fence would remain. And how I officially could ask for that consideration. Um, the fact that you are here tonight, that's officially asking. I'm the only one that's here tonight. Oh. That, that's uh, <laughs> okay. yeah. I, I leave it up to you if you think that's good or bad. Uh, yeah, the fence, uh, I see a fence staying in some format, uh, be it repairing uh, the one that's there or replacing it if needed. Uh, you know, the fence is a small part of the overall project, and so we're happy to look at that as part of the project, see about moving the fence or, uh, you know, whatever we can do to maximize your buffer zone. I, I mean, um, I, I, most of my neighbors would not object. I don't object. I was a good neighbor to the swim club for 33 years. But I don't want the concert in my in in my on my deck, mm -hmm. you know. So I I would appreciate it if you'd consider that and just keep as it was. I I would hear on a daily basis on with the swim club, Marco Polo. <laughs> so I'm I know I'm going to enjoy the concerts also. Yes. But I I really want to be able to you okay. know just give ourselves a little space and and I'd like you to consider it. Um, I believe you said it was by uh, 51,000 square feet. How many square yes. feet? Okay, could you make it 50 and then give us a little room? I'd appreciate that. That's above my pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. That, that's my question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Would anyone else like to uh, come up, ask questions, comments? Yes, sir. All right. So, um, go on to the microphone. Uh, Christoph Mataraki, 740 White Birch Road. Um, I'm mostly just to inquire about, um, so as is with this proposed, um, there's currently nothing really proposed to like right here, right? Correct. Because like, um, could they at least look into like maintaining the old picnic area there? Because I know that that previously had like picnic benches. I think there was some old derelict charcoal grills and stuff. But um, if they could re really look into like at least keeping some form of that after uh, this goes through, because I think that that'd really be an asset that we don't really have anywhere else. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're happy to look into that. Uh, you know, that's more of a. I'll defer to uh, Mr. Boswell on that. If that's if we can just put benches around here without you know going against any you know, DDP things. Yeah, we're we're showing um, general venues. Yeah. And there's obviously opportunities. Or other things if they don't involve tree removal or fill. Okay, I think that pretty much answers that. But okay. uh, thank you for considering. Thank you for coming. Anyone else like to come up and ask questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. I, I, I will get to you. Yep. Laura Namir, I'm 299 Beach Street. Um, one of the things when I was looking at this, I guess first of all, like, I know this is just like a general concept, not exact, but sure. if there was a dog park, it would be great if there was some distance between that and the playground, just for the kids. Like, if dogs get out or whatever it may be, I'm just thinking of like kids and safety purposes. The other thing that would be nice to see, and I don't know how feasible it is, given the lay of the property and everything, but some kind of like summer water feature or splash pad or something small for the kids. You know, we don't have our swim club anymore here. It'd be nice, you know, we have to go to other towns to use the pool. It'd be nice here to have something local, just like a small splash park, something. Even if it's, you know, down here where the playground is, it's like back by the parkway. Hopefully it's not interfering with what's going on up here. Just something for the kids in the summer. Can I take a sure. Um. What do you want? Is there going to be a golf ball for a dog to play? Yes, there's, yeah, I think they might have a dog park for the dogs to play. Yes. Okay. 
yeah, so just something or anything in the terms of like some kind of like splash pad. And also the other thing with the playground too that I'm just thinking about is I go to these new playgrounds now in other towns that are like, you know, beautiful, great playgrounds and there's no shade. Literally, like they're just baking in the sun. And I know this property from, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up here going to the swim club and I know down here it was like very wooded. So it'd be great if like hopefully some trees could be maintained because you go to these places and like all the trees are gone and it's like terrible. Um, you can't play there because there's nothing. So just a consideration. The, the tree removal is highly regulated in okay. that area okay. because it's in what we refer to as a riparian zone. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not even a question. It's it's something that we would have to justify. Okay. And it's a hard justification. Okay. Okay. That's good to hear. Okay. I think that was it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else uh, like to come up? Okay, Mike, come on. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Mike Desetta, 347 Beach Street, I guess the Beach Street residence. You know, I decided You're all to show up. A um, couple yeah, questions come from. The same car. <laughs> she's our new neighbor, so we enjoy having her on our block. Welcome back home. Cause... Thank you. So. A uh, couple questions for Mr. Boswell. Mr. Boswell, you show the red line as the riparian zone and the wetland line as this arc right here. Was that, was that a limiting factor, you think, in the development of this property to be sold to developers because of the limitations presented by the riparian zone and the wetlands? That most developers in the state of New Jersey, and in your professional opinion, would have known that those two things existed, and that's why the swim club wasn't sold to a developer I, I'm going to interrupt. We're going outside the scope of oh, the it does, to, to well, say we want input on the property. Okay, We're that's fine. The past or what All is. right, but is that a fair statement, Mr. Boswell? But are we going in the past? I just want to know if that's. I just want to because I want to know if we could build something here, uh, Jim. But that's what I wanted. That's why I'm, I'm trying to state: Could we develop anything other than the net zero areas that we're taking back from the asphalt paths? So if we were to take back, we add. Are you talking about buildings? Yeah, like a structure or something, a pavilion structure, like for shade oh, or a, a pavilion, picnic grove. A pavilion, you could. Buildings, enclosed yeah. buildings, I don't know. Like a rec center. Uh, a rec center, you... That's why I'm asking. Because you, you, if you can't right. build there, then I want to make it clear that we can't right. build there. Because right. a rec center would be a great point, but if we can't build anything down there, it's pretty much off limits, the way so, it's presented. So the what happens is... You bought it with Bergen County Open Space Trust Fund dollars. We did not buy it with Open Space Trust Fund dollars. We received a grant afterwards for it, but we did not buy it with that. We paid well, for we, it. We took money somewhere under their restrictions. Yeah, but yeah. we didn't buy it with that. Yeah. Well, so it's restricted as open space. Okay. And what happens is uh, if you go to build a community center, mm -hmm. a community center is not a recreation use. It is a... Uh, it is a place of public assembly, so it can be viewed as under Green Acres as a diversion. So when you start, if you wanted to build a pavilion that is open, that's consistent with a recreational. So we use. could build pavilions down there to provide pavilion, shade. Yes. Provide but, shade, cooking grove, or something yes. down there. But if you were to try to build an enclosed building, uh, that could be interpreted as a place of public assembly. And that would require a diversion, which is I talked about risk capital Absolutely, yeah. getting approvals, and and uh, that's a it's a multi-year process. We and it's, do that and too. it's it's a risk and it's a risk and that it's you a, don't you don't know if you're going to win or not. I I doubt you would get approval to do it. Uh, I doubt you would get approval to do it. So, so in 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 theory, the one and a half acre. Great lawn, which is a great concept, because would we be able, without lighting, we would not be able to use it at night for concerts and stuff like that without lighting. The way it's presented now, without lighting. Without lighting? Yeah. I think that's a detail that we all got to sit okay. down and. Develop. So, lighting would be a big improvement to it, would be something we'd have to look at if we wanted to use it for concerts and you know, late night events. Well, Whether I think it's, if you're building a park, you're going to have some version of light. Yeah, whether it's low bollard you said or or a parking lot lighting and so forth, all well, that. It, again, it's a 
detail that we would need to certainly incorporate into the into the design depending on what your objectives are. Do we have a cost opinion for this yet? I'm sorry? Do we have a cost for this yet? No. None whatsoever? No. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, anyone else like to comment, question? Yeah, please, come on up. Uh, Patrick Fay, 107 Cosmo Street. Um, my question is, I'm, I'm in construction. I'm just a worker. I don't have a company or anything like that. And I see a lot of. You just gotta look close to the. I see a lot of um, excavations done with, you know, they take the, you know, they'll move the fill from here, and they'll move it down to try to level stuff off. They'll look for different um, job sites that need to remove fill and bring it in. Is that possible for that? I know I was just asking you about that, but. What you see is a result of a prior earth moving operation that was done to flatten out that top deck. The okay. pool, the excavation of the pool, and they created this 137 elevation deck. Uh, and I think what you're asking is, can we continue that by importing a lot of fill to come down the line? Well, and importing it or kind of taking from the top and it. regrading it and yeah. importing fill. Once you start cutting trees that are west of the repairing buffer, so then I'm sorry, but so this would be the park, and there are trees in here. Anything? Well, it, anything below this? The limit of that great lawn is basically the limit of the flat area. So anything below that great lawn and walking path area is treed slope. So there's some, there's some asphalt in there as well, but there are trees interspersed all through that slope that are below that red line. Okay. So if you're start, starting to consider tree removal, it becomes a very expensive process for permitting. And it's all, as I said earlier, it's, it's, a, it's risk money. Do I think you would get it? I actually uh, uh, would say there's a very good chance you would not get that permit. Okay, so what if you, in removing trees, planted other trees? So as I, as I said, I'm just, that's, a, that's a given. Okay. That's a given. The, 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 uh, we have to do what's, what's referred to as an alternative analysis study of this and that. And one of the alternatives is the no-build alternative. And the no-build alternative, I'm, I'm sorry, the no, the no uh, disturb alternative mm -hmm. on that slope. The no disturb alternative is the alternative you're looking at. So okay. that's, that's what, I, what I've tried to do is I've tried to identify those venues that you could achieve the, uh, the passive recreation, maximize that, that use, that area, and not get into the risky expensive uh, permitting and land development costs. Because when, and, and when you're bringing in uh, fill, what happens here in construction, um, and, and nowadays, it's not like the old days, every truckload of fill that comes in has to be certified Correct. to meet uh, you know, uh, residential direct contact standards. And mm -hmm. So there's a testing that goes into it. There's trucking, there's load. So, it's not like the old days where somebody was looking to get rid of material. Um, what happens is when you, when you have it, you can't get rid of it. And when you need it, you have to spend a lot of money uh, to, to import it. We, 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 earthwork is always one of the major concerns, really because of the testing and the environmental restrictions that go on just the movement of material. Uh, and and I, it's, uh, if it weren't for the trees, I would be saying, yes, you could do it. But with the tree removal, I would say there's a very good chance you couldn't do it. Okay. And for the, <clears throat> for the water um, situation, the pervious, like if you use the asphalt instead of regular asphalt, use the, I think, I'm not sure the correct name of it, but it's pervious. Yeah, um, pervious, used pavers, it up at, pervious pavement and pervious pavers. Okay, so they have it up at, at Wegmans. 
Yep. Where they do. it rains and there's it automatically disappears. It, right. So I know it's more expensive, but is that something that would be would help us out? Could be in a situation here. Could be. You look at pervious pavement as they yeah. as uh, at Wegmans they did it. Uh, you have to do a uh, like an annual O and M vacuum it up, sweep it. Uh, there's also pervious pavers okay. where you have gaps in there, and there's a like a 18 inch section where the water drains vertically through the pavers. There's all kinds of things like that, uh, and you can certainly do that. Mm -hmm. And they all depend at the end of the day on the ability of the ground to absorb it. So you gotta go in, you gotta do soil borings, see the permeability of soil, see where the seasonal groundwater, high groundwater is, right. and then you go from there. Uh, and I'm, I ask all those questions, because to me, just having a, uh, a big, great uh, lawn like this, could bring in outsiders, not, not to be, I don't know, I don't want to say it the wrong way, but you'll have people from out of the towns that are living, you know, may not have uh, some place to go. And now they're coming in here and they're barbecuing and they're hanging out and having parties in this great lawn. That I know that the woman that just came up here probably wouldn't appreciate that. That's my only, that's my fear of stuff like that. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm saying it the wrong way, or it's, it's a you guys understand? Decision, and it is a concern. So, there are and I, I mean, I'd like to, see, I'd like to see, happening. I'd like to see. I mean, there's a lot of baseball fields that you pointed out. Um, I mean, if they want to put baseball fields, I think the pickleball, you know, a couple of years, that's going to be gone. People will be done playing that. I mean, if you, you know, pickleball, tennis, I'm sure you can go back and forth, whatever you want to do. Um, so I just want that to be on everybody's mind also. Something might be in right now, a couple years it's not, and then it's going to go to waste. You know, um, to have a, a great lawn, is, yeah, it's nice, but I, I'd like to make, turn the town into something that, you know, kids can go, you know, play baseball, play football, do all that stuff, you know. If you want to put baseball fields here, that's fine. Then take the baseball fields out of more. You know what I mean? Make that a lacrosse uh, field. I, I'm just, you know, I'm just throwing stuff out for people to, you know, think about. Um, that's just my thought on stuff like that. I don't know if anybody else thinks that way. <laughs> so, uh, I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. No, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Mrs. Zahn. on this gentleman's conversation. Uh, Mr. Boswell, when you talked about the field that we own next door, and you did bring it up, and it's quite a bit of acreage. Uh, years ago, I was on a committee, and we, they were talking about fields. They did a big you know, a review of our fields. And Mr. Statio at the time, told us that what you're calling a water problem, I don't know exactly what you said it was, but it was just a drainage problem, and that drains had not been cleaned out in over 20 years, and that was almost 15 years ago. So what type of problem is there with that town property that we own already? You're referring to Gardner Field? Yes. Uh, along the westerly side. No, I know what you're talking about, personally. The brook, the brook runs in that area. That brook is a category one waterway. All right, but that's down the bottom section. Yes. I'm talking about right behind the houses. There's a big, all full of water most of the time. Oh, behind the houses? I don't know. I don't okay. know. Okay, and, and the, we were always told that there was a drainage problem. Not a drainage problem, some kind of a... An obstructed... Yeah. You could be right, I don't know. Now, so we own all of that property. Was anybody ever looking into trying to do something with it? With this property? I mean, now we have a lot of property. Now it's just done a small amount. It may not have been a bad idea to buy this property, but to use it for such a minimal amount when we have all of this other property that we could use, now I wish somebody would really look into that. Also, the gentleman was talking about uh, people using the field. Well, 
it's in a very secluded area. I know I don't live far from there. And, you know, there are a group of kids that like to ride their bikes around and they're in and out and I think, hmm, cause some damage in this town. Once you have a field like that, which is opened, there's gonna be a lot of things going on and, and, it's, and it's really not a populated area. Memorial Field, kids can't do that. Everybody sees them. I mean, even Clark Field, people are in the neighborhood, there's a lot of houses. But here, there are only a certain amount of houses and uh, I just think somebody should really be looking for something to really make the whole area big and, and do something with it, maybe with more fields. But I, you know, I don't think just something like this and a great lawn, I don't know who came up with that idea, but we're not Central Park. <laughs> and it, just, it was very strange when I saw a great lawn. We live in these towns, and I've lived here for over 50 years, because we want green for our, our kids. We want them to go outside and play. We want them to do things like this. So, you know, I'm not sure most of the residents will appreciate a great lawn when a lot of them have their own great lawns. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, like to come up questions, comments? I don't think I'm missing anyone. Uh, oh, yes, of course. Tim Ritter, 699, Jacqueline, part of the rec board. Just uh, your comment about the fields, um, the Great Lawn. Even it says Great Lawn, and we want it to be undedicated, but we are able to use it. Uh, the rec got together with the, you know, we had some people on the rec board with baseball. We do believe you can use it for t-ball, uh, instructional softball for the girls. Even during the falls, uh, when you don't, you know, little guys don't need a bigger field, you soccer, even maybe even lacrosse. So the term is undedicated, but you, you can use it. Uh, and we thought more for the little kids for the instructional. And that's, that's really where we're going with that. So just to make that clear. So. Thank you. Uh, any, anyone else? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Jim Hansen, 11 Lindenwood Court. So I want to talk about what I liked about this. And of course, there's things we couldn't all have, but the stuff that I liked about it is, sure, we call it the Great Lawn, but big open space, undedicated, unplanned. I have two kids that have grown up through the rec, rec committee, or through the rec and, and stuff in town. And a lot of times when they were really little, it was just put cones out. It wasn't have dirt fields because the kids fall down and having the little kids play in the grass, I thought was great. They tried soccer on the grass fields. They did t-ball on the grass fields. You just throw out those little bases, right? They're, you don't know how far they're running. You put cones out so they run to it. Uh, there's kickball now. So a lot of little things for the little kids. And then for the seniors, I'm 55 now, I'm getting older. I'd like to have a place, go play Frisbee. Go do something, go for a walk, go just be out there, you know, with the kids, with hopefully grandkids someday. You know, so it's unplanned, unscheduled, it's not dirt. And that's why all these extra baseball fields, they're only baseball fields. And having your kid fall on the dirt, they're getting all scrapped up. So having the grass, I thought was great. Plus, it's very little cost. All you gotta do is get somebody out there mowing it, we don't need super green grass. Crabgrass works. It's just, it's a field. You know, let it kind of be a little more natural. You don't have to take great care of it. Pickleball, yeah, it's a fad right now. Maybe it'll keep going, but as I get older, playing tennis, I'm not playing tennis, but hitting the pickleball during COVID, I bought a pickleball net. So a lot of people are doing pickleball, and the reason I like it here is you read up on pickleball, black, black, black. The people on the parkway are not going to care about hearing pickleball. I, I think we're far enough away from you, you're not going to hear the pickleball, right? We looked at the basketball court. That walking path through Gardner Field, well, the basketball court is over at Gardner Field. So we looked at it like, do we need another basketball court? I'm the basketball guy. We're like, no, you can go over. The kids can walk through and go play pickleball. The kids being out on the bicycles, 
my kid through COVID, they all rode their bikes. They were not home. They were out doing stuff. And I credit those kids to do everything that they did and got through and survived all this stuff. And they got great friend groups. Giving them a place away from the traffic, away from the big traffic zones. They can go there and be safe as kids. And yes, we're not supervising them. No, we shouldn't be. They're going to do, they're going to be kids. The picnic tables there now? Yeah, you know, maybe you throw some picnic tables, but do we want a picnic grove where people do come in? Or do we want that just to go back to nature? And that's the idea, right? It's open space. Tons of trees. Let it go back to nature. Let's get together and clean it up. And maybe there's a couple of picnic tables down there that people can, can put in and, and use. Maybe there's other stuff. So these are ideas. And my wife is walking our dog every day. And Aim and I talked about the people that walk around the lake. It's a racetrack around that lake. Yeah, you know, I walk my dog over there too. But I live on this side of town in the dog park. My wife was ecstatic. Now she can go walk. Her, we can walk the dog. Lots of friends in the neighborhood walk the dog. Meet here. Socialize a little bit. If you got little kids, you got a playground, you got pickleball, you got other stuff you can do. And then we have this cool walking path over to Gardner. So you can go see your grandkids on this great path. In that water area, it's not that it's, I walked back there, I've looked at it. It's a, it's a little pond, a little more than a vernal pond. Let's clean it up where the kids can go see the frogs and the tadpoles. That's open space. So there's so much I like about this, and the cost of this is probably the min most minimal thing we could come up with as a town to make use of this. So I'm a strong supporter of it. No, I didn't get everything I wanted. There's going to be some other great ideas, but I, I think you'd really put some good ideas on the table, and I hope we can collaboratively work together towards it. So thanks for the chance to talk and be part of this group. Jim, you want to uh, you want to take this back, Jim? Oh, I got more. Comments. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone else? Okay. Not seeing any hands. Um, I want to thank you all for turning out. Uh, each one of your comments, questions will be taken into account. Uh, we took notes, and WCTV is recording this. Uh, they told me it'll be on the channel and on YouTube. Oh, Diane, I'm sorry, did I miss your hand? Um, yeah, oh, yeah, do we have those? Oh, 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 okay, yes, yeah, so, so that, that's the answer uh, to scan that QR code. Is, is it on the website for people who aren't used to QR codes like myself? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so again, we're going to compile everything. Uh, I would hope to have another meeting in September. We'll let everyone enjoy the summer. Uh, but you know, this is the you know a new starting point for this project. Uh, I commend the Rec Advisory Board in working with Boswell to take it this far. Uh, you know, but again, we're we're open to comments, suggestions. We're going to compile them, and we'll see where it takes us. So you know, thank you all for participating, and uh, enjoy the summer. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Kevin, did you want to add anything based on it? No. Eamon, did you want to add anything? No. no. It was awesome. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you again.